1250. And uh, I believe we have a, uh, we, we should have plenty of time for questions. Um, uh, but I want to um, start by putting Mark uh, on the spot because I know he can handle the pressure. And um, Mark, would you restate the question you asked so that um, Kristen and Howard can have a chance to, to respond to it because I know you wanted the insights of all three of the speakers. Sure. So the question is how do we <clears throat> engage with the um, intended audience of end users to better improve the products that we're creating uh, to serve them? And so specifically, the examples would be uh, things like the ClinGen uh, resource, uh, the Ignite page, uh, those sorts of things. Um, we're just not engaging with the end users in a substantive way to be able to make sure that what we're delivering is what they want. Okay. okay. Well, one one of the okay. things, so we've done that a little bit locally and pointed out sources, and uh, one of the things we've found is that if if the if the resource meets an unmet need, then they're they're all over it, and they'll use it and go for it. If it doesn't meet an unmet need, they might use it once because it's kind of neat, and then we'll never go back again. So I think part of it is making sure that as many of the unmet needs as possible are, are included there, uh, and and uh, you know try. I mean, it's, you know, logical stuff, but that's barely been the because when it comes down to a lot of the practitioners, both in oncology and then we, we do some work in solid organ transplant in the psychiatry area, all those different areas, they only have a fixed amount of time for any kind of education, some less, some more, um, and and just don't want to know about anything unless they can use it. You know, so. I think part of it's just making things more practical and, and more more obviously practical, uh, because that's then they'll find it. But in some ways, that's tautologic, because if you can't get them engaged on the front end, um, then it's difficult to get that information back. You know, because we have good evidence that you know, ClinGen, and, and I think it was a subject of an entire NHGRI meeting, was that ClinGen was a really necessary resource and that everybody endorsed the fact that this is meeting an unmet need. But I think what we're seeing is is that while we're trying to make it practical and be able to deliver information at the point of care when a clinician has a question so they can answer it quickly, actually getting to the point of having them even use it that one time to provide feedback is, is the difficult, that's the difficulty we're having. How do we reach them? But, uh, isn't this more like Turned it off. Howard, isn't this more like uh, Apple and the iPod? I mean, it's, it's convincing somebody they need to buy something they don't know they need yet? It, so if we could figure out how to do that approach, yeah, that model would work. But the problem has been we, we, haven't, we haven't had tools that answered the broad burning questions to the point where everyone's got to have one. And even though they didn't know what it was five minutes ago, they just got to have one. And, that, and that's been, been part of it. We also don't have the marketing budget that Apple did in order to drive, uh, drive people to want to have that. I mean, I, I do wonder, I don't know if, if Bob's still here, but uh, I don't, have we ever tried uh, the, uh, like a white label approach where a, a uh, society can stick their name on it, powered by ISCC um, type of thing? Because that, that might be one way of getting, getting uh, past the uh, mass mailing uh, uh, issue. We, we have not tried that. And I would add, I guess, two things um, to Howard. Um, one I think is really important is that I think we have to keep in mind that not the information doesn't just have to be there, it has to be easily accessible and usable. And so I think looking at, I know, um, I don't see Donna in here, but I think Donna did usability testing for G2C2 um, and did it in conjunction with another conference that you guys had last so, last summer, and so I think next year with the Precision Medicine Conference, we'd like to do usability testing with the Ignite Toolbox and really say, does this, is this doing what we think that it's doing? So we, I think we have to ask that question. And I think the other piece is incorporating it into um, training. So uh, Bob mentioned um, the TRIG program, um, and Rich Haspel is really led. It's really an amazing program from the content and the approach to learning, but you know, it's really a part of what they do as part of the training. And so it's got to be incorporated into kind of that applications-based this is how you use it, they really have to, it's almost like it has to be part of the training to train them to use the tools. So, so again, I'm going to push back because we know all the, oh, yeah, really. Um, so, so the issue is not how to do it. I think we know how to do it. It's 
if I'm trying to sell my vacuum cleaner, I can't even get my foot in the door to the people that are using it. So, so I c we've done the, the meeting thing with usability, but we've done it at genetics meetings. And, and how can we get to all of the other meetings, uh, you know, to try and get it in front of people? Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that it, and the reason I was picking on Bob, was because we have a convened group of people across multiple specialties that are engaged in this area. And so it, it's, it, it seems to me that that's a group that could serve this function, but we've not been able to really get that across the, uh, the finish line. You mentioned a convened group that are engaged in this area, and maybe that's the key, is you really need a convened group of people who aren't engaged in this area to kind of right. see what is it, what's the barrier, and what's keeping, you know, if it's, if it's not being used, what, what and why that is. So, so, so my comment is related to that. So um, the traditional academic approach to, is to build a solution and then find a problem to solve with it. And so uh, if you're a, more in the commercial space, you would uh, say, I, I think I know uh, what problem I need to solve, but then an, entertain a marketing group to help, you know, that does focus groups and really tries to get under the hood of what's going to really get um, traction if you actually develop the product. What solution is it trying, what problem is it trying to solve and how would it be adopted? So I don't know that, I, I think you're, you're sort of going in that direction where you would say, um, let's really get the user community, which is what you were saying earlier, to, to help us understand what their needs are and then modify or build those solutions. Yes, you. Yeah, I mean, I was going to sort of say something similar. I, so maybe, Mark, you can clarify who end user is. I, I mean, is that the clinician, physician, whatever, at the point of care? Because I'm not sure that they have, they feel that they have an unmet need, right? And I don't know that it's realistic that they're going to pop onto ClinGen or ClinVar or PharmGKB. I mean, we, you know, in our CDS alerts, we link them out to evidence. And uh, the last time I looked, no one had ever clicked on it, right? So I think, I, I don't, I mean, I completely agree with Jeff. I'm not sure that, I'm not sure they feel they have a need and they're not going to go do something extra in their busy clinical time to do something that fills a need that they don't even recognize that they have. Yeah, and, and that may be the, the issue. Uh, now, again, you know, I'll just you know, push back in terms of Jeff, is that you know, we did, we had pretty good signal that, you know, that, that there was a need for ClinGen from a pretty broad group of, of stakeholders. And so it was, it was compelling enough that you know, there was a funding announcement that was issued and, and acted on and has now been refunded. So, um, but, <clears throat> and I think the point that, that Julie is raising was a very good one, is that even in the implemented things, using uh, resources within the electronic health record, we know that if you present a best practice alert that has a link to additional information, that at most 10 percent will actually say, well, why did I get this alert? The rest of them will either follow or not follow the alert. So, you know, it's, it's, it's that 10 percent where you might be able to get some substantive feedback um, about how to make it fit within workflow and that that we're really trying to, uh, to get at. And it, it's, it, it's, a challenging, it's a challenging group. And, and again, I, I don't want to do have this dominate the whole hour of discussion because I think we'll retread a lot of ground that we've spent the last four years talking about, and my question was really a very simple one to the ISCC uh, as opposed to, but if somebody has a, a, a well, brilliant so, solution, we well, can. And, and C, the CMIOs and the patient safety folks have been some of our biggest friends at, uh, not just at Moffitt, but at the other health systems we've worked with, because for two reasons. One, they recognize the systemic nature of the problem, and so it's a, it's a bigger one to them. Secondly, they have the tactics to achieve uh, what we just talked about, uh, and and so it's you know it's been a great group who will go in there on on behalf of the physician community implement something and uh, you know with some you know champions and stuff like that. But so I think there you know that that might be the the group we need to engage with more. And I think to add to that, to to you know my experience is that they might not necessarily click on whatever that resource is within the electronic health record, but they're, they're very eager to use kind of the, the one-page summary that they hang on their wall or that they can put in their pocket to just tell them what is it that I do in this particular scenario. And so maybe the question, I know recently it, it is um, 
I thought it was a really good opportunity. So when the last ISCC meeting, um, Bob had people go through and just present what their educational programs were, and it stuck out to me. I thought, so Gecko, it, which is the genetics group in Canada, the way that they approach this is they have kind of three levels of education for each um, topic. And I'm probably saying this completely wrong, but this is what stuck out in my head. One is a one page, one's like a three page, and one's a lots of pages. And so maybe the the, the missing or the key is, is looking at what is it on ClinGen, and then how do we put that in a format that's usable in a one page or a half a page that really just answers the one question that that, that clinician has as an end user. So. And that's the approach I'll take in my organization because I can do that. But there's not somebody like me, fortunately, for the rest of the institutions in the United States and elsewhere um, that's, that's doing that. And so in some ways, we're trying to walk that um, balance of saying, we anticipate that there's going to be a broader need. We won't have the people on the ground to synthesize that information in most places. So how can we compromise so that somebody can get a, an answer? Because people use things like uh, UpToDate and, and, and WebMD to answer clinical questions. And we know that we have a 30-second window to get them to an answer. And so we're, we're building off of techniques that we know can work and that physicians do utilize when they're confronted with clinical questions. <clears throat> but um, we just haven't been able to get, you know, the, the, con the confirmation that the way we're presenting it is really the best way to do it or if we could do it better based on their input. Yeah, and I think, I think that's where the, the, the sort of partnering role for ISCC and bringing these different expertises together. So there are dissemination platforms out there, Medscape, UpToDate, things like that, that we have not systematically um, looked, looked at that are already out there. We don't have to build anything. We have the resources. We need to understand the needs of the end users and match it up with the resources and figure out how to disseminate them. So, you know, in term, and you, sometimes you need a hook. And so for, to, for this conference, the hook for me would, would have been, um, uh, boy, you know, given a choice between two agents with equal efficacy, you can have one that has a 15% major adverse event, or you can have another with a 5% major adverse event. Which one do you want to choose, or which path do you want to take? That's a pretty good hook. Um, so so that's, that's that. The second thing I want to say is, is about ISCC. ISCC is, is participant driven. I mean, we provide um, uh, some administrative support, limited. Uh, we can't do all of the work. Uh, and it really, it, we're trying to shift it away from it being an NHGRI heavy in terms of uh, focus. Uh, so that we can encourage people to participate more and to build these things um, outside of, uh, you know, my heavy hand on the calls and on the meetings. So um, that's really, really important is to stimulate that awareness that this is an organization that will be driven by the participants. And if the participants aren't doing anything, it's not going to do anything. So that's really important. While I have the microphone, <laughs> I want to um, follow up on something that Howard said about uh, including the other professions and nurses, for example. And this is another plug. So uh, Donna Messersmith and Kathy Calzone, uh, Donna Messersmith from my office and Kathy Calzone from NCI um, have a, uh, a summer short course. It's uh, this year. It's four days long for nurses, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants and their educators. Uh, and that's on the NIH campus, campus. The applications for participation are is still open, I think, through the rest of this week. Uh, you can contact me or Donna Messersmith uh, and or look on genome.gov for uh, short course nurses, and you'll find um, the course. There's a link there to the application uh, website. And I encourage you, if you have people who are interested in doing that, by all means, do that. Um, we are also aware uh, that one of the barriers that hasn't been talked about much to um, engaging providers in terms of participating or uh, learning how to do this in their own uh, things is not the knowledge or, or the, the, the willingness to do it, but not knowing actually how to put it into their workflow. So if they work with an NP or a PA or something, who, what's the best way to sort of work uh, this into the workflow of their particular office that works for them. And there may need to be some discussion and education around that to help them become comfortable with implementing the information that we're trying to teach them. And just a, a, just a quick follow-up to the web's, uh, WebMD kind of up-to-date. Having worked as a writer and an editor at one of those publications previously, you know, we were kind of limited to a maximum of 28 lines. So it's kind of like if you, we had to get, like, how to treat hypertension in 28 lines. And so maybe that's part of it is saying we, we have, you guys have 28 lines, you know, and making it kind of makes you pull out the meat of what people need to know. 
You know, following up on both what Mark was saying and what Bob was saying, in, in clinical IT, when we have an intervention that we want to do and we want to release IT that alters a workflow, we find that the, the best way to ensure that that gets adopted is to make sure that it will save the clinician time. And I think that, so one of the things that may be necessary here is to think about how could expand the scope a little bit beyond just pharmacogenomics, but, but including pharmacogenomics to providing support around a particular type of decision that a cl clinician me needs to make and provide enough support so that for that transaction, for that encounter, you can actually save them time. And that may help with adoption. Yes. I think it goes along with this same theme. <clears throat> We've studied adoption a lot at our, in our 1200 patient project and we went in with the hypothesis that it was going to be around this idea that people who got prior education in genomics were going to be the earliest adopters, younger providers. And it turned out not to be the case at all. And the biggest factor, the biggest driver was how much, how many patients the, the doc was seeing that day about whether they looked at the alerts or looked at the clinical decision support. So I think it really echoes what a lot of people are saying is if it's in the workflow and if it can be done in a short amount of time, we use the 30 second idea, then usually they'll adopt. So I have a uh, comment or a, a, a question from Lynn and who had to leave earlier. And that's that in uh, use case development and um, she was pleading for um, these sites that have use cases posted that there be, you know, real life cases where pharmacogenomics made a big difference in a patient's life based on real life information and evidence. And she was looking at some of the sites and, and was finding kind of these theoretically based use cases, but not, you know, real life examples. And so she was compelling the groups that are developing these educational materials, I think, to, to keep that in mind because uh, she felt that, that these would be particularly compelling uh, types of cases to include. And I actually, to, to Howard, to your, when you said about the molecular tumor board about, you know, the Jack one amplification, isn't that cool? So this is Jack two, sorry, <laughs> Jack two, right, that's even cooler, that's even cooler. Uh, it goes to the kind of the opposite end of the spectrum of what Lynn was talking about, which is, you know, I've been on molecular tumor boards as the basic science repre representative where we have a patient who has nothing in their tumor genome that's actionable, but they have a really cool amplification, <laughs> you know, so there's nothing actionable about it, right? But it is, it is an observation that comes out of the testing that we did. So you know, how to communicate that, whether to communicate that at all. So the first thing we say is there's nothing actionable in this patient's tumor based on these genes that were sequenced. But there are some interesting molecular pathways that look like they might be dysregulated. But so how do you present those kinds of cases where there isn't anything actionable, but there's interesting biology there? Uh, if there's interesting biology, often, often the group may come to the conclusion that it is actionable because they're, the, the option is to put people, put someone on a, a therapy where there's not even a hint that it might work. And so that's what we've done in the past, put people on a trial, because the, the main criteria was the trial was opened at our place, at a place, and the patient fit the, fit the you know, the organ function criteria or whatever. Um, now at least there's some hint that that pathway is dis, disrupted in some way. You know, can they go on to that, preferably on a clinical trial type format. And so it's not, but we, we've had a number of situations, several that have resulted in, in R01 grants where we have this accumulation of abnormalities that were not druggable, that we put to the, the more basic folks, they took it into the lab, generated some data, and they, they got funded at the NIH for research purposes, partly because they were using real data and trying to solve a real problem as opposed to doing just disruption of every base and you know try to find a problem type thing. So there's there your research in clinical should not have a divide. Uh, it should be a continuum. Uh, but often academic centers are not structured in that way. Uh, they're structured your research or your clinical and you know don't even meet in the cafeteria. Jeff. So I just want to echo Lynn's request because I think that 
idea of telling genome stories is a, is a really uh, important one. When, you know, whenever I see presentations from the Undiagnosed Disease Network, it's incredibly impressive and it, and it hits the patient provider, it hits the family, it just is a very compelling reason to keep going and doing this kind of work. So if we can tell the same stories like Angela's story, and you know, there's, so there's both successes and failures, I would say that we could tell those stories that would make it real for the average clinician and patient that doesn't understand what pharmacogenetics really means. So, and, and I think um, maybe we put that as part of the Ignite toolbox or, or someplace, but we have to put it somewhere. Co coincidentally, um, Anastasia Wise and John Mulvihill are presenting UDN to ISCC as we speak. Well, I think there's an opportunity, too, with the case reports that, you know, while we've tended to make them sort of static and durable materials, there would be no reason that those case reports couldn't be presented in a, um, in, in a format um, uh, um, uh, that, uh, like the Grand Rounds or something, and then have the uh, actual case report uh, available as well. I think that could potentially increase the utility of, and visibility of them. And you, not to put more work on the Institute, but um, you're having a webcast, uh, you know, cases in genomic medicine or something like that um, might be a, a way to get that out. The, you know, often, unless you know a journal that will take case reports, you don't tend to write them up because it's too much hassle. Um, this would be a venue where you'd get credit for it. And um, from, a, from an oncology standpoint, uh, the American Society of Clinical Oncology has just opened up a new journal, the Precision Oncology, JCO Precision Oncology. Uh, and, uh, part of that is that they, and they welcome case reports. And the reason why is that the more case reports that are published, the easier it is for an oncologist to get the drug paid for by uh, an insurance company. So there's, you know, added value to case reports beyond just uh, a way forward, but actually a way forward that might actually get the drug paid for. So, so Bruce Korf is the incoming editor of the uh, Journal of the American, uh, what are, Journal of uh, American, no, the American, Oh, yeah, yeah. So anyway, one of those journals. Uh, but, I, but I think he's a <laughs> but, but I, I, I think. You want to um, start over, Jeff? <laughs> no. Um, but I, I think he, he's, a, he's obviously a very good friend of this community, and I imagine he would be um, interested in at least uh, entertaining the, this as a venue. Is this, are they, what kind of what we're thinking of, Mark, is this similar to the genome uh, case conference series that you host out of Geyser? I think it's the Genome First conference series as far, as far as what we're talking about, just from an educational perspective, even though it's not looking at pharmacogenomics specifically. Well, I think it's just a, uh, the, the, I have a little bit of an affinity for the case reports in ISCC just because uh, um, I was involved early on with the, sort of the developing of the format and the templating and that, and, and was hoped that. This, again, this would be something that would go out where the societies would take ownership and create cases that were relevant to them. So the model could even be, and Bob can tell me if, uh, you know, how many of the societies have really taken this forward, uh, but out, even outside the realm of PGX, you could imagine that if societies have venues by which they can present case reports, that if we could assist them with some of the uh, you know, relevant information for their society, whether it be around pharmacogenomics or other type of genomic interventions, that using a multi-media uh, type approach with a formal case presentation, the durable case report, et cetera, might be of some value. Yeah, the, the, the case reports have, have um, the case studies working group um, created the template in, in those first two or three um, uh, uh, cases, and, and it has not been taken up widely by the others. We haven't had the bandwidth to lobby, um, and really I think it takes sort of going to each one and saying, hey, did you know this is there? Pick out the things that are most relevant to you, and we'll help you write the case study, or we'll get other people, geneticists, to help you write that. So, yeah. Yeah, I think figuring out how to incentivize people to write those case reports and to write the, the lessons learned type papers. So to the, um, the point you were making earlier, I think that Lynn made about the, the real use cases that people have experienced. I mean, I'm often involved in conversations about, should we write a paper to tell everybody, like we, we tried these four things and like these three failed miserably, but this one kind of worked. But, but in the, the, the list of all of the things that people have to do, your data papers and your discovery papers and like the things that will go to a higher impact journal tend to get the attention first. But for the community, some of those 
mid-tier paper lessons learned, here are the things we tried that failed and here's what kind of worked, is really meaningful for moving the field forward. So thinking about how we can kind of push ourselves and, and our peers to, to put more of those out and to realize that even though they're not going to get in to New England Journal and JAMA and Nature Genetics and Science, they're still really important for the others in the field to know what to try, what not to try, or even if it failed at one institution, it might work at another. So an another issue that, um, or question that was raised in my mind, Kristen, during your presentation was the certificate program. So you have a curriculum developed around this certificate program. So how common are these certificate programs? How do you develop a curriculum and keep it up to date? And was that, that the certificate itself, was that a demand by the end users who, who wanted that as something they could take away? Or was, how, how was that decided? So, so there are two things that we have that kind of have the word certificate in them. One is a, um, a, certif a certificate program that's a 25-hour program for practicing pharmacists, and it's part of the continuing education model um, that you can award a certificate based on certain requirements. And there has been a, a need within, express need within the pharmacy profession for more education and certification within pharmacogenomics because it is difficult for many of those frontline pharmacists. So that was in response to a need, and it is associated with um, something that they can show, you know, evidence of that. We also have the graduate certificate, which is an academic program that's nine credit hours, and we're in the process right now of developing that curriculum, and we really have been doing that by um, you think it's kind of starting with, with a template and then um, just sitting down and talking through with our oncologists, with our different groups to kind of get input on what that looks like. And um, it's actually, we're in the middle of doing that right now. It's been an incredibly valuable process, but it is kind of saying, what do you think that, that people need to know in this area from a lot of different disciplines? I don't think that there's another program like that out there, so, but we're excited about that one. Bob? Yeah, so uh, um, also in Florida, Jeff Vance at the University of Miami, something in the water, he has a master's program which runs concurrently with medical school. And uh, there's a number of people who have actually come to that medical school, enrolled in that medical school because of that program. So it's actually a draw to the medical school. Um, in addition, the, um, the UK, uh, the National Health Service, the education program, they had, what did I say, 20 million pounds or something for three years to do this provider education around genomics. Uh, and one of their implementations was to create programs, sort of a stepwise, a, a program where you can step off at any point. You can get a certificate or you can go on and get a master's degree that are taught at academic centers and the providers actually get time off to, to actually attend those uh, and, and get those certificates or degrees. So there are other examples around the world for this, um, but uh, as far as I know, everything else is in Florida. <laughs> yeah, so to, just to clarify, so the, the graduate certificate is, you know, essentially a working professional program. It's online. Um, so at UF, we have a robust um, working professional educational program. We graduated on Friday, 75 master's students in working professional master's degree programs. Um, the vast majority of those are in forensics. So, um, so the idea is that this may evolve into a master's degree program if, you know, if we see the demand, but that it's really tailored around something that people can do sort of from home, you know, do graduate level coursework, but from home, you know, in the context of their position to advance their knowledge and skills. Well, that was another, another question about you know, not having to travel. So how many of these things are actually, some of them are offered passively as after the fact videos and stuff are posted, but how many are actually offered as sort of interactive online uh, courses that people could take without having to travel to Florida? Um, unless it was a winter. Yeah, exactly. Um, as far as I'm aware, there aren't any online interactive programs kind of um, in synchronous, but we are, I had talked to Lynn because I know she had that question. Um, we did record the conference and we are making all that content available online um, as, as much as we're able. And that's kind of probably the, the most that's out there right now once we, we get that as far, at least as far as pharmacy is concerned. Um, but the graduate certificate. Yeah, but the, right, exactly. But the graduate certificate itself, like Julie described, would be interactive and online. And so it would be a fully online program. And, and actually, you know, it'd be possible for someone to just take one course out of that. So it wouldn't necessarily, you'd have to take the whole, you know, the whole thing because that would meet that need. 
And one of the one of the enhancements to to these courses, even if they're sort of in person, at a particular site, uh, that we think will be helpful, and this has been piloted at, at City of Hope, is to build a community of practice around uh, the group of participants and and have that grow every time a new group comes comes through, and that's primarily an online um, uh, uh, group, and different people do it different way, just through a simple list list serve or other methods. Um, but that has proven to to be a way to keep people engaged um, over time. In, in continuing to keep up with what's happening. So, yes. Uh, I just want to mention the University of Colorado Denver does have an interactive pharmacogenomic certificate program that they uh, recently launched a couple years ago. So, so in the, is that a multi? Is that a multi day? Is that a how, how does that? Uh, I don't have a ton of details on it. I think it's 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 an online um, for about a month. I think it runs a um, couple hours a week, sort of a thing. Uh, but it's it's synchronous. You, there's modules that you go through along the way, uh, and and our company is actually providing participatory genotyping for that program. So, um, one of the things we found with our pharmacists after we had them out doing the pharmacogenetic tests and after the training program as they came back to us and they actually said they wanted more interaction, they wanted discussion boards, they wanted to share some of their experience, they wanted had an opportunity to discuss some of their cases that they had. So we um, implemented a monthly webinar as well as part of this. Yeah, and that, that, that was another question I had about sort of follow-up. So there's, you know, Participants take these courses and there's usually some sort of immediate follow-up follow about the impact of the course, but what's the longer-term follow-up and engagement opportunity for these people? Because I, I think very much the same, same thing is that people, people want to continue the discussion um, in an interactive way, and that's sometimes very challenging to support in these kinds of approaches, but I think very important for long-term traction. Mm -hmm. And they want the feedback as, what, as to whether or not they handle a certain case appropriately and, you know, what worked for them uh, or what did not work for them, and they want the discussion. Yeah, and we had our participants requested that at the conference to create a group that they could continue to interact with each other. So we, we, we would have done it anyway, but they, they really asked for that. So. Mark. I think one of the examples we could look to is the uh, City of Hope. Uh, cancer genetics course. Um, they've uh, done this, um, I, I don't know how many years, but it's uh, well over 10 years. Uh, originally uh, funded by a grant, but then has now become self-sustaining. And um, not only does it provide intensive um, uh, hands-on activities, uh, both in person and remote, uh, for the course attendees um, specific to cancer genomics and cancer genomics practice, uh, but it also provides a sustained uh, forum by which people can bring cases, uh, consult with uh, other course uh, attendees and graduates, uh, and they have an annual symposium um, that many of the attendees come in for uh, refreshers and updates. And so it's, it's ended up being a very uh, robust model, and it w if we could replicate something like that in the pharmacogenomic space, I think it could be very interesting. So in, in the last five minutes here, I'm wondering if each of the three speakers would, even if it's restating stuff you said in your presentation, sort of sum up in a minute or so what you think are the major educational gaps as they relate to promoting implementation. What, where do you think the effort needs to go in the near-term future? Uh, for educational activities to really impact implementation. And let, let's just go in order. So Kristen, you want to start, and then Bob, and then uh, Howard. Um, first, I just want to echo what Mark said. The City of Hope, that's an excellent model, and um, one that I've really looked at in developing our programs, too. Um, the one thing that I would take to kind of my biggest soapbox passion is implementation. And so we base so much of what we do within our educational programs on cases and patient cases that we, you know, have, uh, that we've seen within our clinical programs. And so I think that is essential is that it has, it's kind of the chicken before the egg, but I think that having your implementers involved, your frontline clinicians involved in the educational process is so important because that's where you're gonna get that, the things that people need to know, that really practical piece. So to me, that has to be a part of it. Okay, thank you, Bob. Yeah, so I, I think that starting at that at that uh, target learner end and really un understanding, uh, um, 
you know, what is driving them to learn and what kind of information that is actionable in their clinic now and how understanding how to do that um, on across multiple spe specialties and on scale um, over time because this is, you know, pharmacogenomics is just one piece of what's coming down the pipeline and we really need to understand how to do this um, at large scale um, in, in the future. And so I think this is a really good, uh, uh, good test case for that. So getting that participation as well as um, uh, focusing on the quality of the implementation of the education and that involves uh, partnering with education, adult education specialists, people who, who know how to do this, who have data behind their methods, so forth. And if we find gaps where there is no data, then we need to get that data. I think those are the two biggest things. And at a, at a um, local level, uh, trying to include the education in the things that are already happening. So, you know, stealing a month of the hemonc rotation type of thing where they're already going to do a rotation, why not have it focused on that area? Um, I think is, a, is an opportunity that we haven't really exploited uh, very much. And then at a, on a larger level, um, I think we're focusing too much on the genome. Uh, the, if this uh, meeting today was um, e efficient therapeutic medicine using genome as the tactic, um, I think it would have broader appeal than genome medicine. And those of us that are here know what genome medicine is, but a lot of our target audience are just trying to um, practice medicine <laughs> in, the, in the pharmacy sense of it or the medical sense of it, the nursing sense of it. Um, and so I think keeping that focus, I think, will be valuable because that way people will, because that's what they're wanting to do, and they won't get uh, stuck on the double helix part. Okay, any last comments from the audience? If not, um, I want to thank everybody for the discussion and uh, thank again our three speakers. And Terry, I turn it back to you. So uh, what we're going to try to do now is kind of run through things that we've heard in the past two days and also come to some consensus at least on, uh, on those things as well as, as sort of opportunities for research and uh, uh, clinical informatics and a couple of other things. So uh, Mary and Simona and I have prepared a, um, a summary and I'll just walk up there and do that.